Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your host and chief cat herder for this hour. I'm very glad to see so many of you here today for a very, very exciting topic. Now, before we begin, let me introduce the forum and explain what it is, how it works, where it came from. Then I'll introduce this week's panelists and start the show. So to begin with, you should know that the Future Trends Forum is a conversation-based medium. What I'm doing right now, showing you a slide, is just going to happen for a couple of minutes. The idea here is for video and audio conversation. And the idea for this came out of an ongoing project called the Future Trends and Technology and Education Report, or FTTE. And that's a monthly trends analysis that looks at the major forces reshaping higher education, including technology as well as the context in which higher education works. If you haven't seen it, take a look at FTTE.us and you can download a few sample issues. Uh, subscribe if you like. But that's a research publication. What we do here is the interactive conversation-based side. Now, the two of those, the report and the forum, are both parts of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. And this is an ongoing multimedia participatory attempt to try to better understand where post-secondary education is headed. So that includes the forum, includes the report. It also includes a book club. It also includes a blog. And it includes a bookstore and more to come. So if you're interested, go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do this work with the support of some generous sponsors, and we'd like to thank them before we proceed. So to start off with, I'd like to thank NYSERNET in New York State. This is a terrific nonprofit that does great work in getting that state's colleges and universities online and doing interesting projects with broadband networks. We're really grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindy makes available the technology that we're using right now. So on that note, let me just walk you through it so you can see how it works. Now, where I am and where this slide is just for another minute is called the stage. It's called that because everybody involved in this video conference can see and hear everything that goes up on the stage. In a couple, just about a minute, we'll have our guests up here on stage and you can join us. And I'll show you how to do that. Now, right below us, if you look around, you'll see dozens of icons, either of uh, silhouettes or video feeds or photos of individual people. Each of those represents one sign-in from somewhere on earth. So it might be um, a president and CEO of a company, might be a professor, might be three people in the conference room. If you'd like to learn more about a person, you just mouse over them and you get a little bit more information. And if you'd like to speak with them and have a private conversation, just double click on them. If they want to speak to you and their technology is raked up, your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audiovisual bubble, which is pretty neat. Now, how do you participate in all the conversations I've been talking about? There are three main ways, and you can reach them all via a strip of options in the very bottom of the screen. You'll see a white bar running along it. On the leftmost edge, you'll find a button that has a number and what looks like a few human head silhouettes. Right now, the number is 39, now 40. That's the number of people who are here involved in this video conference conversation. If you click on that, two windows will pop up. The one on the left will give you a film strip overview of everybody who's involved in the conversation. On the right will pop a chat box, and you can type in chat commentary to the roughly 19 or so people who've come into this conversation with you. It's a pretty classic chat box. Um, it's a nice way we find for people to uh, make jokes, but also to do research, to share thoughts, links, readings. Um, and people often try out ideas through the chat box, so that's one key way. Now back to that white strip. Next to it, you'll see um, a question mark in a circle. If you click that, up will pop a little box that'll let you type in a question or a comment. So if you'd like to ask us something, or if you'd like to just make an observation, you can type in there, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud for everyone to hear. Now, Next to that little question mark on the white bar is a raised hand button. Now, this is the most powerful one. If your video camera is working and your audio is working, click on that, and that'll tell us that you'd like to join us up here on stage to ask a question. So when the time is right, I'll hit a button, up you'll appear, and you'll have a conversation with everybody involved. It's really easy to do. So you can use video, you can use text chat, or you can use a text question. And those are three ways. If that's not enough for you, you can go into another tab or another browser or another device and head over to Twitter and just use the hashtag FTTE. You find some of those people like to ask questions there and make comments or tweet out discussion points they think are especially important. So 
All of those are ways to interact with us. All of those are really functional. And we're really grateful to Shindig for making available this technology. We're also really grateful to our friends and supporters on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a crowdfunding site, uh, kind of like GoFundMe or Kickstarter, where it lets you support an ongoing creative project or person. In this case, it's our work here in the future of education. And you can see from this banner here, a whole bunch of people have been supporting us, like Michael Haggins, Bob Johnson, Corey S., Chris Lott, a whole bunch of wonderful people kick in as little as a dollar a month to keep the show running. If you'd like to join them, and I hope you do, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. We're really grateful to all of our Patreons for their support. So, that's where the forum comes from. That's who supports it. That's how the technology works. Now that you have a sense of it, let's talk about our guest this week. I'm very, very happy to have two uh, striking guests. We have Catherine Prince and Jason Swanson. They're from KnowledgeWorks, and they do some great work there in forecasting the future of education and technology. But recently, they just published a forecast for the next decade of higher education called Navigating the Future of Learning. So let's see what they have to say. Let's bring them both up so that we can get a sense of what they think uh, the future of higher education is likely to be. So I'm going to add them right now, one by one. Let me bring up Catherine, and let me bring up Jason. Catherine, can you hear me and see me okay? Hello, yes, thank you. Oh, very good. Where are you today? I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, are you underwater? Uh, it just started raining as I was sitting here, but we haven't had big flooding. Wow. Okay, well, I'm glad. Please stay safe and dry as best you can. Thank you. Um, and Jason, can you hear and see us all right? Hello. Hi, Jason. Where are you today? So I am joining you from right outside of Philadelphia in uh, West Chest from Westchester, Pennsylvania. Oh, sure. How far are you from uh, Westchester University? Uh, not very far. Probably 10, 15 minute drive. Oh, sure. No, I know it well. Well, listen, Jason and Catherine, I'm really glad that you both had the time to make you say. I really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, just before we, in order to get things started, I'd like to ask you a really quick question, both of you. To introduce yourself, I, I mentioned really briefly that you both work for Knowledge Works and that you offer this really nice report. But let me ask you another way to introduce yourself. If you could just tell me what you look forward to working on for the rest of 2019. What's going to be the most exciting thing? What's going to be taking up most of your time? Um, so we're working on a strategy guide that responds to the forecast you mentioned, taking a deeper look at kind of how stakeholders across the education spectrum can shape the future of learning. So that's uh, an exciting piece. Oh, great. What is the due date on that? It's due out around the end of June, early July. Oh, fantastic. Please, please let us know when it comes out so we can spread the word. Well. Is that both of you or Jason, you're working on something else? It, it is indeed a collective effort. Um, we're also uh, working through producing a forecast on the future of young children and their families, which wow. knock on wood should be out during the fall. <laughs> and then Great. aside from the content creation piece, just navigating stakeholder engagement, um, everything from workshops to public speaking, um, a couple of opportunities in late fall to design some immersive experiences or some simulations for the future, um, mm -hmm. which take place probably late September, early October as well. Oh, great. Oh, well, please, uh, the, the forecast for the future of children and families, let us know about that. Um, Absolutely. That's terrific. Um, I'm so glad you did. What a, what a great project to work on. Uh, friends, I, I'm going to have a whole bunch of questions for our, our poor, hapless guests. Um, but don't let me take over the, don't let me haunt the mic. Um, I'm going to start with a couple, but I'd really like to hear what you think. So based, if you've had a chance to read it, please, this is the time to check in with questions and comments. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, but based on what Catherine and Jason say, um, please, again, click the raise hand button, click the question mark button, and let us know what you think. Um, so my first question for both of you is, when you completed this report, uh, when you are ready to share it with the world, what are some of the conclusions that most surprised you? Hmm. Uh, 
I don't know if it's a conclusion necessarily, but I think as we were looking at a lot of the opportunities and challenges that that a lot of the the inbound change we see affecting education systems present, it was really to reconceptualize schooling as a place of healing and holistic human development. And then when we look at sort of the broader conversation right now that's happening, um, really about the future of learning and innovation writ large for education, it seems to be narrowing, right? And it seems to be narrowing in response to the fear around the uncertainty of the future of work. So what we've seen is that conversation seems to be st- not stuck there, but but narrowing. And then when we look at what's catalyzing innovation, it seems to be in response to that fear. So as we work through this forecast, for me, that, that the big insight was this growing tension, right, of thinking through sort of the broader purpose for both K to 12 and post-secondary education. But then, it, 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 you know, this narrowing in scope for, around this conversation for, for what maybe the public believes uh, that purpose could be for that's that's almost fear driven right now. Mm. So a key thing, I mean, is the, is the expansion or the growing use of, or thinking of higher education as a place of mental and physical healing, but also you're seeing a narrowing. Can, can you speak to that narrowing a bit more? Absolutely. So <clears throat> instead of thinking broadly about the, those partnerships that we might incent, right, to bring into, and not just higher education, we'll, we'll, we'll say, you know, P to 16 and beyond, right? Okay. Um, and thinking through what, what does, what are maybe the, the true benefits of bringing a mentor in or an artist in residence or an expert um, that could encompass everything from maybe expanding on notions of success, Mm-hmm. Uh, different, different job pathways, not the least of which is leaning on their skills, expertise, and insights. It's very much driven from workplace readiness, right? So what skills are you going to need uh, to then jump into the employment pool? Mm-hmm. Um, which, again, it's we've got an interesting tension there, right? We, we've got to solve for an immediate need, right, which is how do we fill jobs and, and the near term, right. but also balance that out with our awareness and our assumptions around change about how work might look in the long term, right? Mm. Um, so it becomes to us that this this balancing act of a both and, right? So how do we meet those needs? But at the same time, if we recognize there's inherent uncertainty as to the vast amount of futures of work, and that's creating an ease, maybe then it makes a lot of sense to step back and say, maybe it's not about really creating the, like the skills, knowledge, and dispositions for a certain workforce pathway, but then to give you the skills inherently to navigate ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, oh. so both are different value propositions for sure. Yeah. But again, yeah. this is just, this is what struck me. It, Catherine, I'm sure has a different answer. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Catherine, what did you find? What's, what surprised you in the production of this? I think while we've been talking about an era shift emerging for a while, thinking more deeply about the, um, the profound impact of that era shift, not just for education, but for society generally, and then thinking about how education needs to be central to defining new organizing principles for our times and has opportunities to lead the way to that. So getting way beyond kind of managing an institution or managing a sector of education, but really thinking about how education contributes more broadly to society. And not just in terms of kind of developing young people, helping people act, um, develop throughout their lives, but, but really its role in social regeneration and the heightened need that we're going to have for that social regeneration and the remaking of communities as we move forward. What does social regeneration mean in this context? Um, I think for me, it means thinking about how as as places and society in general um, experience strain between kind of how we are used to doing things, how we have our institutions and our structures set up, and then we look at how the world is changing. You know, there's a significant rub and, and then some specific places, some specific organizations and institutions will face, you know, 
specific versions of stress given the, the way things are changing. So kind of needing to say, how do we remake ourselves at that kind of micro-organizational level, but also how do we remake ourselves you know, at a broader level, kind of what what do we need what do we need to put in place structurally, infrastructurally, to kind of make education and, um, and the other supports we provide to people you know, work for the world that is emerging. Working for the world that's emerging. So for you in this report, a key thing is the transformation of the labor market, of the economy, as well as of communities themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is fascinating. Well, this is what you both saw when you were writing and, and producing this. What kind of what responses have you been getting from uh, different members of the higher education world? Um, have people greeted this with open arms? Have they seized on any particular points that we should know about? Um, we have been getting I think, fairly positive reception. Um, at least that's the, that's the reception we've tended to hear about. Um, uh, I think that people um, have tend to ex ex when they engage with the forecast, uncover a lot of potentially negative consequences related to the the growth of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and and also what we described as the accelerating brain's driver of change. So the, sh the changing nature of cognition as we as we use more tools and practices informed by neuroscience and also just change our brains through our engagement with pervasive digital media. So that that kind of thing can spark a lot of anxiety and, and, and just a sure. recognition we may not even understand the kind of the brains of the people we'll be educating in a decade or more. And so what does that mean for our operations? How do we answer that question? And mm. and, and it's hard to know how, the way in today, but people are starting to name that as a need. Please go ahead, Jason. I, you know, I, I'm in, I'm in agreement. <laughs> really, uh, that tends to be um, reflective of, of our interactions with folks. So, you know, I, our workshops tend to, to run a similar course in, in responses right now when, when working really at the driver level of this forecast and when we kind of engage in that processing it starts off as almost a, a fear-based response right especially yeah. to in terms of automation and general tech acceleration but then when we step back and say okay so these are the big bucket areas we think that are ripe for transformation <clears throat> that are afforded to us by these drivers and from our view so here's some possibilities or scenarios of the future that might give us some clues into how we respond right they're not predictions we're not prescriptive it's just asking what if um, we find that really quickly that fear that reaction to the tech goes away and everything becomes mm. really quickly human centered Right. So how mm. can I, I use these technologies to create mm. efficiencies in our practice uh, from a classroom management standpoint to, to lean right. more into the human relationship aspect um, yeah. from the standpoint of, you know, a personalized learning framework? What does it mean to charge harder at that? Right. So what does sort of like the personalized learning 2.0 begin to look like? And, you know, mm -hmm. wow, we've got a really interesting opportunity here to really put um, a holistic view around human development at the front and center of learning now that's afforded to us by these technologies. Uh, we can expand student impact and governance in new and novel ways that we've never been able to do before. So it's, it's really interesting that it, it shifts like on a dime and, and that's been really personally pleasing to, to watch that happen. Um, but I, I think that yeah. there's there's a lot of opportunity there, no matter what sector you're talking about, whether it's higher ed and post-secondary, whether it's CTE programs, K to 12 programs, whether it's community and out of school time learning, um, that once you step back from that instant reaction of like, oh my God, everything looks is going to look different and you can really see yourself uh, harnessing these these trends to begin to actively shape the future into one that hopefully is maybe more desirable than the present. I see. So the drivers themselves can spark some anxiety, if not panic, but trying to implement parts of the drivers into the actual practice of education leads to more pragmatic, if not positive response. Um, you, you have five major drivers of change. And I just, for those of you who haven't had a chance to uh, read the report, which again, I strongly recommend and There's a link to it here on the, on the forum. Uh, one key part is the uh, advent of artificial intelligence, algorithms, automation. A second part is what the authors call civic superpowers, 
I want to ask about this, you know, where you see engaged citizens and civic organizations seeking to rebalance power. And maybe this ties into your comment about regenerating society. Are you describing a rising, say, uh, political consciousness among traditional age students? Or are you seeing them using new technologies to organize and reshape society? Uh, or are they trying to alter the governments of universities? Let's speak more to that, please, if you could. Yeah, I think we were more focused on kind of their, their engagement societally than at the institutional level, but I think it has implications mm -hmm. at the institutional level. So we were seeing um, both a greater political awareness and also just greater ease in kind of using the range of tools that we have available to connect with others and to mobilize action. Mm -hmm. um, and not just limited to, to student populations, kind of a broader societal shift too. Um, so then um, considering how that has the potential to, to really democratize participation in many ways, including institutional governance, to kind of change the expectations that people have in, in having a say in what happens it's societally and institutionally. So that I think that this area does have a lot of potential implications for how we might govern our institutions moving forward. Um, but it, it, but there's also, I think it does depend on, you know, making sure that as we consider those expanded forms of engagement and governance, that we're also working really hard to be inclusive and finding ways that um, engage a broad range of stakeholders and not just the ones who might be most ready to step up. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a double-edged sword, right? So these technologies sort of lower the barrier to entry into civic participation. Right. Yet at the same time, if we look at 2016 and the leveraging of bots and you know sort of russian influence in the political sphere it it you could have just a small group of actors really begin to take over political discourse right so mm. um we can use it to shine a light on things but but yeah there, there has to be a careful balance there um but fundamentally these, these are new tools that give us ways to engage in ways that weren't possible even a decade ago that really begin to expand on sort of that desire to include more student voice and agency and empowerment um, really in just new and exciting ways. Do you think that will lead to changes in pedagogy such as a greater emphasis on uh, inquiry-based models of learning or project-based learning? Um, perhaps tied into the increasing dissatisfaction with uh, standardized testing? I hope so. Um, so uh, Catherine had mentioned that we're wrapping up a strategy guide right now. So we, we had stakeholders really work deeply with all the drivers, but in particular, I think that this driver was of, of interest to a lot of people. Um, so in sort of synthesizing all, all of the work that our stakeholders did, um, there is a pressing need, right? So one of the big implications of this is that if we're going to have these new civic superpowers, we need to start to think about sort of how to teach to, teach to the megaphone, right? You've got these powers, but how do we teach you to use these responsibly, right? And, and how can we begin to align pedagogy in a way that really lines up with sort of this new emerging world of civic participation, right? Um, so you've got that, and then as you alluded to, Brian, it becomes a really powerful tool to put external pressure on the system to maybe say, hey, like maybe standardized testing isn't the way, and not only can we attack it from a parental and, and, and policy perspective, but the actual users of the system now can really organize and have a voice that maybe they, they hadn't before. And, and I think that, microphone. That's a great phrase. I'm sorry, please, Catherine, go ahead. All right. Um, so I, I think that that pressure on standardized testing and then the, the pushback we're starting to see or the querying is also you know coming from other forces of change that we highlighted, including really pertaining to the toxic narratives driver of change, which looks at how our current narratives and metrics of success are causing a lot of stress to many people across age groups. Could you say um, a bit more about that, please? That's yeah. a really key point. Yeah, so we, I mean, there's growing awareness that the, the ways in which we define success that are kind of high level societal narratives and then also the ways in which we define success in education, what it takes to get into college, the fact that going to college is still the dominant narrative, you know, what it takes to at university and so forth you know, can be seen as limited. And, and there's, I think there's been pushes to broaden kind of how we, how we um, understand 
success, how people can demonstrate it, but at a systemic level, that's still not dominant, that broadening is still not dominant. So again, we're seeing a lot of friction and a lot of awareness that the things we're, yeah. we're, we're people aspiring to for learning, more inquiry-based, mm-hmm. more project-based, more human-centered, more social-emotional, and so on, are mm-hmm. really hard to um, implement fully when the ways in which we, we measure educational success and hold educational institutions accountable are kind of looking at a much narrower range of, of measures. But also, still, I think we don't as a field yet know how to measure all of those things that would be desirable well. So there's also, I think, right. wise caution. So on the one hand, we have uh, we have the sense that the some of the technologies that we are uh, that we are using uh, have risks and uh, downsides to them. Um, we also have the problem that uh, we don't, as we try to grow students and develop their capacities in new ways, that we don't have good assessment or metrics for assessing them. Um, I was asking about change in pedagogy, but now along with that will be a change in assessment. Uh, friends, but before I go further, let me just ask you, this is um, a, a place for discussion. And you can tell because one of my cats has just jumped in my lap. Um, so I get to be like uh, Blofeld from James Bond. Um, I would love to hear from you. So uh, as, as we're, uh, we're covering a lot of ground, um, so please, as you, uh, as you hear these these two brilliant people with describing this really great um, landscape of change, uh, please you know, come forward with your own thoughts and questions. And as I say this, uh, we just had two people raise their hands, which is remarkable. I think it was the cat that triggered the whole thing. Let me see if I can bring up um, uh, John Gould, who's not too far from you, Jason. Uh, he's at uh, Drexel. Hello, John. Hey, how are you? So, um, I do want to say uh, I use your materials in my doctoral classes quite a bit, Um, all of it, because uh, we have K-12 higher ed, and actually we have people outside of education who work in a business environment, and uh, we use this quite a bit. We we start out with with teaching about systems thinking, then we go into Otto Sharmer's Theory U, and then we end up with design thinking, a 10-week uh, design studio where they have to reimagine education for the future across all sectors. And so um, what I'm interested about is, is as, as you're talking about this, and I, I just watched a video of Tom Friedman talking with the head of uh, the global initiative at McKenzie, and, and Friedman was talking about, you know, the different levels of, you know, when he wrote The World is Flat, And then as he began moving in into this and the thing about AI particularly is, is he's talking about, you know, how AI is going to change the nature of interaction with learning and then eventually calls it, I I forget exactly what he calls it, but he said, what's going to happen is when you wear the watches, you wear the world clothes that they're going, that what we'll be able to do is to generate for you as an individual, and I think about this in terms of kids and adults, that it will prescribe the type of learning for you. And it will actually prescribe many things for you. And and as I'm thinking about that, I'm curious about the pushback that you might get um, as you look at this, because if, if, you know, our problem is we are all product of the present educational system, whether it's K-12, or, or higher ed, and, and I think it was already Goss said, we don't have any memory of the future, so when we go through all these activities, we end up reinventing what we just are trying to get rid of. And so I was just curious about what, what type of, of, of pushback are you getting on thinking about the structure of how schools, whether it be K-16, are going to evolve? and what people are thinking about, or is it the same old, same old? We are, we are hearing a lot of excitement about um, the idea of kind of expanding learning ecosystems and the idea that the boundaries of between, of our, of and between our educational institutions and other kinds of organizations are blurring and that we might be able to think about kind of coordinating resources and experiences and assets beyond our current day institutional boundaries and the ways that support people really well, help them engage with community-based resources in ways that can be hard today, et cetera. So there there tends to be a lot of excitement about that, but we're also getting pushback, including some kind of early experience with community-based learning organizations that have tried to lead the way in taking that more ecosystemic approach. 
that it's really hard um, to take that view in our current structures, like because we don't have um, a clear sense of institutional ownership long term. It's hard to have fun um, oh. sustainable funding oh. for the different structures. So that kind of at the, at the level of institutions versus the tech, that kind of thing is coming into play. Um, and then you know our organization beyond our foresight work focuses on fostering personalized learning. And and when we even if we're just looking at, at that and not bringing in the, the foresight work, there's there, there can be a view of personalized learning that it's very tech based. It's it's, it's reducing human relationships, and I think that the, the kind of AI prescriptions you're describing kind of exacerbate that fear, even though they also can open up some, you know, really great possibilities for tailoring experiences, and they don't have to mean that people are kind of isolated, and, you know, all the kinds of things that come to the fore of the fear side of the conversation. Are, are you bringing this conversation to the, the, I think, what really blocks a lot of this is the political sphere and also the business sphere. How are they reacting to this? Are you getting the types of conversation? Because again, politicians, you know, the products of what school used to be, so their tendency yes. is like no, no child left behind, you know, race to the top, all of these things are count, counter to what you guys are, are proposing. And I'm wondering how you're bringing them into the conversation. Good question. So, so through KnowledgeWorks policy team, we are going to be doing some joint work in some selected states to kind of bring in this insights from our forecasts alongside pol um, policy recommendations they have for moving toward more personalized learning to start engaging folks specifically around this. It's not something we've done yet, but we're kind of making that organizational attempt. And then we also do have opportunities to go to other people's forums to share. Um, and. And we, we take those up when we can. Um, you know, we've been really focusing, on, I would say, mostly on kind of trying to raise awareness of the issues and then finding effective ways of communicating about them in the policy sphere, which is really different mm -hmm. than in the institutional sphere. Great. Well, John, thank you. Oh, please, uh, Jason, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to just just to piggyback a bit on Catherine. It, it's we've got to use. <clears throat> different tools for different audiences, right? And, and this was a conversation we just had this morning with our policy colleagues. So if I were to, to go to, um, you know, my legislator and say, let's talk about AI and education, chances are their, their eyes are going to glaze over, right? So rather than getting into strictly futuring, right, and say, let's talk about scenarios of the future and what's possible and what could be, I, I think for certain audiences, it's going, let's just stick with issues framing right now, right? So let, let's talk about these trajectories of change before we even get into what might be possible or even preferable or a range of futures. Let's stop there. Let, let's kind of do some level setting and then think through that those really sticky questions as a policymaker, you're going to have to think through. So one example could be, you know, that, that, description of, of an AI-infused uh, future of learning that you mentioned, John, would be, okay, so from a policy perspective, right, if we're going to bring these things into a K-12 realm, two big questions come to the fore. First, this is relying on biomarkers, right? So if we're going to have wearables, we're going we're gonna to kind of figure out when your optimum state for learning is. Do you have meaningful policy in place from an education standpoint to really think through the capture of, of biomarkers for kids. That doesn't sound like a great proposition, right? And then let's go a step further, right? So, okay, cool, your, your district signs off on this, right? You, you've got policy in place to, to really bring uh, this AI in. From a policy perspective, who bears the responsibility when those algorithms are proven to be biased? right? You're working around bad data and it's creating bad assumptions in terms of recommendations for that student, right? We're seeing cases now where algorithms and designers are bring, bringing, in, bring, bringing brought into court and, litig and having litigation brought against them. So what policy barriers do you have in place and protections do you have for, for the user here? Um, which runs counter to sort of an American viewpoint, right? Is that when the technology fails, it's the user's fault. Yeah, and, and tied into that, it's kind of interesting because it, in that, that clip with, with uh, that discussion with Freeman, what they said is that right now, if you think about from a curricular point of view, is that every kid 
needs to understand the technology. So that's got to be built in. But the other thing they said is civics has to be built in so that we understand the sense of community and what it means to create um, you know, a social contract, whether it be in a community or a region or in a state, that, that that's something that's missing. And those are the two skills that they feel are extremely critical that we must address. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, John, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your great question. Uh, we have uh, more uh, people who want to take the stage. And let me bring up a good friend of the program, Peter Shea. Uh, so let's see if Peter is available. And Peter, it looks like your camera is on. This camera may be on, but the bandwidth. Peter, say something. Can you hear us and see us? Peter, can we can, can you see. Hear me? Now we can, yes. You can? Excellent. Welcome. Great. Welcome aboard. Thanks, everyone, for the talk. This is one of my favorite topics, so I'm, um, I'm totally geeking out about this. Um, there's been a, a lot of conversation in the past um, year around education and the future of work. I mean, just yesterday, um, MIT's edX released a new MOOC on the future of work. Um, and then there's been um, like Charles Fidel's um, TED talk on AI and the impact on education. Um, so th things seem to be accelerating in this area. Um, but the perception of the acceleration, I think, is for people like us, is skewed because we're in the, we're, we look at this on a regular basis. Do you get a sense from your work that there is a, um, a really a strong new paradigm emerging on people who have the power to really allocate resources to build a new kind of um, uh, educational infrastructure? Good question. I think right now I see the conversation as being most in, in the education domain as being mainly focused on what skills, knowledge, and dispositions do we need to help learners develop for the future. And I do think that there's a lot of work around future graduate profiles and other ways of getting to that question that's helping people bring in perspectives on the future of work and other shifts to help rethink um, where we land and, and what, 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 what education institutions are aiming for. I, I don't see it as much at the kind of structural level yet. I think it's still kind of feeling mostly people are trying to kind of manage for that future from, a, from the, within our current institutional boundaries. Yeah, my, my sense is that in, that infrastructure is going to really be built on the shoulders of partnerships. You know, especially from mm. the public or the K-12 standpoint, mm -hmm. we've had massive disinvestment in that sector. So when we look at what's going on in terms of uh, speaking to the future and building out that infrastructure, it's typically within the context of a network and ecosystem and founded on partnerships, right? So, you know, what's it look like to kind of meaningfully link that K-12 to system, the higher ed system and other assets within a geographic location, bring in private partnerships, uh, phil philanthropy is playing a huge role in this, but it's almost like we, we need to have from a policy perspective, like this idea of like a moonshot, right? So how do we, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. if, if all of this is swirling, right? If we're talking about it, if MIT's like it, nearly every player in this space has that awareness in terms of accelerating change, in particular, the future of, of work, right? So at what point does it hit crisis level to kind of trigger the, the, those kind of levers of action to say, we, you know what, we've kind of got spots of reform, spots of transformation, but we need a, oh, an entirely new infrastructure to deal with this at scale. Um, I think it's going to have to kind of hit that like point of just, oh God, we, we need to do something. So maybe a crisis will have to drive it. Peter, yeah, yeah. great question. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, friends, uh, you're, you see how easy it is for me to uh, toss one of you up here on stage through video. Um, so uh, we're glad to have as, as many of you as possible. In the meantime, we have some folks who don't have a camera that's on. So let me quickly uh, put up a couple of their questions and comments. So we have one right now. Uh, this is from uh, Charles Finley, who says, I appreciate the long-term goal of learning how to navigate the future of uncertainty. Any suggestions for how to accomplish this goal? And in a sense, I guess the answer is stay tuned for the strategic guide coming up in a, in a little while. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I think that there's small steps we could take, right? I, I think that it's, you know, thinking through the, those types of skills, knowledge, and dispositions that we want to cultivate in our learners that really allow them to navigate inherent uncertainty and complexity, right? So uh, what can we do to help them build deep self-knowledge? What can we do to help them build deep social awareness, right? What, what can we do to, to support critical thinking? Um, it's, so all of these skills, so these, these are small steps, right? You know, larger questions would be how can we authentically bring in ambiguity and, and, and uncertainty into a learning environment, right? Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot of steps that we could take ranging from classroom practices all the way up to larger systemic changes, right? From, you know, thinking mm. through how might mm. we metrics and, and credential certain SEL skills, uh, you know, cognitive and non-cognitive practices, things like that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a lot to, to, to chew on right now. Catherine, do you want to add to that? I would say that I think another tactic we can begin to pursue today is, is this Think is to figure out how to broaden our what we mean by engagement and, ha and how we involve all the stakeholders of learning, you know, the learners themselves, faculty, um, administration, community stakeholders, parents, and, and so on and so on, in learning in appropriate ways. So, um, how how can we open up kind of our, our, our governance as we were talking before, but also our mm -hmm. consultative processes, so that we're including more kinds of people and a, a greater range of um, experiences in kind of finding the way together since it is so much change that you know we, we need a lot of voices and a lot of people's perspectives to figure out to get through the change especially if we want to have a goal of a more equitable future of education well, very good point uh, and speaking of voices uh friends we are coming up on the last uh 10 minutes or so so this is the time to get in your comments and questions before uh, jason and Catherine get released uh to uh, continue their work um, so again, just press the buttons at the bottom to uh, raise your hand if you'd like to join us up on stage with video, or press the question mark if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, a question like uh, this very good one right now uh, from Ginger Grossman, who asks, all right, Ginger Gossman, who asks, who owns those data? Does FERPA apply? These are some of the questions we were asking, Re AI. Those are the questions that, that we're grappling with right now, and I, I think that these technologies really present the occasion to really almost in, enter into a new paradigm for thinking about data policy. Um, mm. And I think the movement has to be from sort of a mindset of protection to a shift to student ownership. Um, so we, we're tracking with you. I mean, that that is the question. So who owns it and what's going to be the most effective use of it? And then, how can we educate so who owns parents? It and who, what's the most effective and use of data? And, and so, then you're empowering them. students more than just protecting them. Mm -hmm. And then, educating people about the nuances of their data rights and responsibilities, and as well, to be a part of that. No, I'm not sure. Um, did you hear my question? Uh, it sounds like you're empowering students more than protecting them. Hopefully, that would that would be the aim for it. Well, very good. Very good. Well, that's a great question, one that we've been touching on the forum for about three years now. Um, it's a really, really deep question. Uh, we have time for more questions and comments. And we have one from, uh, uh, let's see, we have one from uh, Tom Riley up in Boston. So let me see if we can bring Tom on. Hello, Tom. I'll give him a second for the bandwidth to go. I have a feeling that uh, the forum is uh, working hard on North American uh, bandwidth today.
Tom, I don't know if we can see or hear you right now. All right. I think we're having a bandwidth issue there. Uh, Tom, if you can, just uh, uh, why don't you put in your question via text uh, so that uh, we can uh, we can bring it up in a bit. Uh, let me ask uh, one more question for uh, for all of you right now. Um, you know, thinking about uh, where all of this could be headed. Uh, do you see American higher education as a whole uh, expanding, uh, growing, perhaps grabbing more non-traditional students and more uh, international students? Or do you see the total sector of American higher education in stasis and a plateau? Mm. That's a good question, Brian. Um, <clears throat> I almost feel like it, it, this sounds terrible, but it's almost a both and future. I, I think it's it's headed oh, for some oh. sort of consolidation, but I think at the same time, what we think of as, as the higher ed market or, or even the post-secondary market in terms of a credential standpoint it is headed more towards diversification. So maybe less institutional yeah, players, yeah. more partnerships, more on-ramps, more offerings, uh, both in response to a changing world, but more specifically into the, the changing economics of higher education and the perceived yeah. ROI and workforce okay. demands. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Catherine, do you want to uh, chime in on that? I would agree that it seems likely we'll have some kind of industry consolidation and, and then I can't hear you right now. Um, let me try, I'm going to try bringing Catherine down and bring her back up on stage. Let's see if this makes a difference here. And while we're doing that, um, we have a question coming um, Another. Can you hear me now, Brian? Oh, I think we might have lost Brian. <laughs> Um, but Jason, I was as I was with my volume was getting lost and reinstated. I um, kind of agree with you that we're facing industry consolidation, and we certainly have demographic shifts happening across the United States that are going to kind of change where the college, the traditional age college going population, or some of the older college age population reside in relationship to where many of the institutions are. But again, I think if we if we restructured some of what we mean by post secondary education. And inst you know, institutions got creative about kind of how what what their learning experience offerings look like and how people enter and leave more easily than they do today. Then that could kind of counteract that kind of along lines what you were saying about the credentialing market. Absolutely, um, that's a great thought, Catherine. Thank you. Um, and uh, sorry, I think I had a bandwidth stutter at this end, um, but we have to one more person, um, and we bring in Jessica. Uh, let's see if we can get her here. Jessica, is your camera on? No. <coughs> Jessica, why don't you... Uh, Jessica is... Uh, could speakers discuss learning ecosystems, uh, their approach a bit more? Any universities on board, leaders, collaborators in this? Are you approaching universities? Yeah, so the way we would describe a learning ecosystem is really um, a density of partnerships that allow for learning experiences to seamlessly flow across a set of environments in conjunction with resources, right? So that would be sort of the vision for this. It also adheres to a complex adaptive cycle uh, as ecosystems do. So it's constantly in flux, right? It's always trying to find uh, that right combination of partnerships um, for it to be at its strongest. 
In terms of folks that we've seen implementing this really well, um, from my view, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and the Remake Learning Network um, do this. Their focus is on kids and all of learning. So higher education is a very real part of this. Um, so they have roughly about 600 organizations all working in, in this sort of ecosystem or, or network capacity, um, really designed to create learning experiences that are relevant, that are engaging and that are equitable. So the higher ed side of this is really working in tight partnership with the K-12 system. It could be everything from designing cutting edge and innovative PD that respond to this kind of emerging um, landscape of you know relevant learning, um, all the way out to things like Carnegie Learning and, and a lot of the CMU spinoffs who are creating like these AI infused technologies. So it creates a, a true partnership that if you're a student going through those, you get a lot of real world experience going out and being able to access right that network and really kind of puts you in the driver's seat in terms of project-based learning, real-world learning. Um, and it's just an all-around really interesting model. That's fascinating. Catherine, do you want to add to that, please? Sure. So KnowledgeWorks as a whole is, I think, involved in some work that may eventually help us move toward a more ecosystemic, ecosystemic view and through our participation in something called a college and high school alliance and also some work we're doing in a few places around kind of pathways that link um, K through 12 with, with post-secondary. I think those I see those as kind of early steps that are happening today that begin to kind of broaden toward an ecosystem by having more people involved with one another in a more integrated way. Fascinating. Well, um, thank you, Catherine. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm conscious of time, um, and we're we're running out of minutes. Um, so uh, let me just encourage everyone to get a chance to ask their question. But before we do that, uh, I want to circle back to a point that you mentioned before, Catherine. That was so exciting, uh, and so so bold. You said that in about a decade, we might not recognize the brains of the students that we're working with, mm -hmm. um, and and this is a key part of your report. And that's one that I find often not addressed in a lot of forecasting work on the future of education. You refer to accelerating brains. Can you sketch for us what it would be like, what a student of the year 2029 would be like? What, how, is, how are they going to be neurologically different? Um, I don't know, but you know, I, 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 almost, I almost feel like it's, it's very hard to know until it's happened. But one thing that I hear a lot of people talk about is um, how overwhelmed we are today and how much more we, overwhelmed we are likely to be by all the input and technologies in the future. And I and I, I like to ask, is that going to be true for for students who have, right. have been used with this? You know, I, I just think the, the, yeah. the lived experience of of navigating this kind of a future is is likely to be different. Um, you know, we are hearing. I think it's possible that the students could have more trouble focusing as we define it today. We've heard some people question whether they'll be as prone to be able to engage in empathy and other interpersonal skills. If we, but again, I think a lot of what we project today in the conversations we hear is more about the fear of the, the impact of these technologies on our biological cells from today's vantage point versus being able to conceptualize yet kind of the positive sides or just, or just the change that are, changes that are neutral, but that are, are different. Changes that are mutual? That are, that are neutral. Oh, neutral. Not, right. Yeah. No, very good. That's a that's a that's quite a thing to think about. Um, how do you think instructors today and people who work with instructors, how should they start preparing? So I think it's helpful to find uh, ways to bring in insights that are emerging from neuroscience into our educational settings through appropriate tools and practices. And so not saying every educator. Um, needs to become an expert in, in, in making that translation, but we could consider things like specialist roles that are really focusing on making appropriate use of those insights and helping other educators understand when and how to apply them. Um, there's, you know, I think there's a lot of great work going on at the moment in terms of helping people manage their and regulate emotionally through mindfulness of, um, mm -hmm. and kind of trauma-informed practice into educational mm -hmm. systems. And so those feel like kind of promising things people can do today that we can keep building on as we continue to gain more insight 
Um, mm. And then there may be times when there are kind of specific kind of um, cognitive enhancement tools that we want to think about bringing into educational settings to meet specific needs. But I think we're probably mainly at the, the, the place of kind of mapping out kind of what, what's available, what would be an appropriate use, what are the rights and responsibilities these questions work through before we do much of that. Absolutely. There's even simple questions we can ask too, right? So if we look at sort of the neurological effects and cognitive effects of the built environment and time, you know, so if you're an instructor and you want to start to look at how do you cultivate like lines of thinking around creativity and innovation, and you know that you're going to be heavily reliant, at least for some of your class time, in terms of creative thinking, then there's there's kind of basic things you can do, right? So we know that you can schedule or plan to hold a class that's around nature in an environment with high horizon lines. When I get into Ooh. more analytical work, you know, I, I need a more confined space, right? So these have neurological and cognitive effects too. Um, so there, there's like those kind of those small steps that we can play with. Uh, nature is always a winner in all of these, right? It's got an energizing and calming effect. There's a lot of solid neuroscience around that. And then it's getting real about the myths that we perpetuate around this as educators, the left and right brain mm -hmm. dichotomy, right? The, mm -hmm. the idea that neurologically and, and cognitively that there are learning styles, there's, there's no right. evidence to support that, right? But we and love that idea love it right but there's going to be certain things maybe that i gravitate more towards in a fashion that i like but from a cognitive standpoint there's no evidence to say that i'm an auditory learner versus a visual so uh, i think getting real about that and finding ways to reframe those uh those myths a little bit are, are probably a positive starting point nice i wonder if that's a good um, bit of optimism for rural colleges and universities which are in many ways suffering from enrollment, but now can pitch themselves as being better for the mind. Absolutely. Well, speaking of, um, of looking ahead, uh, we are at the end of our hour, and you two have been fantastic, fantastic guests. It's been great reading about you, listening up to you, uh, expound upon your report, looking forward to where you're going with the strategic guide next. Um, let me ask, what's the best way for everyone to keep up with your work? So you can follow us through KnowledgeWorks, and one of the links in the in the platform is points to our contact us form where you can sign up to stay informed about the regular communications we put out about the future of learning or our work more generally. Yes. Um, and, and we blog regularly as well, highlighting kind of different aspects of the work, things we're thinking Very about. Good. Very good. And uh, on the bottom left of the screen, you should have a link to the report itself. So if you have a chance to read it, now is a great time. Uh, let me thank you both so much. You've uh, been very generous with your time and very patient with my uh, brief technological glitch. Uh, thank you both. But um, but don't ever want to leave yet because we have to uh, right now uh, just quickly point out where things are going next to the next week of the forum. Uh, so let me just bring up um, some bit of news that you should be aware of. So next week uh, we're going to have as our guest Professor Stephen Brent, who will be talking about uh, a new book which offers an optimistic view of where higher education could be going, along with prescriptions on how best to realize that. So please stay tuned for our last March event. Uh, our book club is on the cusp of picking our next reading. We have a whole ton of votes, a really tight election. So please, this is the last day to chime in and, uh, and cast your vote before we decide what we'll be reading next. If you'd like to read one of those books and grab a copy, head to our bookstore, which of course has links to all kinds of awesome titles, including titles by many, many previous foreign guests. Now, if you'd like to keep talking about everything from the changing brains of students to new governance forms to how we can best prepare for the future of education, according to what Jason and Catherine have been describing, there are a lot of ways to keep the conversation going. We have groups, the Future Trends Forum on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook. You can see here Twitter links to myself as well as to Shindig, and we'd love to see you on our blog and to hear from you. Otherwise, thank you so much for your great questions and comments. Look forward to seeing you next time.